Hi, I'm Karen Orhan. And I'm Steve Nystrom. We're from Camden Hills Regional High School in beautiful Rockport, Maine, where it's about 75 degrees today. And we're looking forward to getting back there this evening. We, uh, we came down here for two weeks with uh, NASA and have absolutely loved it. We've had a wonderful time here. Couldn't ask for more. So that's, that's my contribution in there. I, I've really got to thank NASA, got to thank RTI and all the other contributors to this project. Yes, it has been a particularly wonderful time. And um, as you'll see on the next slide, we have a few other people we'd like to thank. We worked with a mentor, Dr. Jonathan Ransom. He is the director of the Durability, Damage, Tolerance, and Reliability branch here at NASA Langley. Uh, that branch is the branch between materials and structures. And they do lots of fun things because they not only get to crack things, but they get to hit things and break things and examine what happens. So it's a, it's a very fun place to be. And we got to see lots over there in the labs. And there are some other people we'd like to thank in addition to Dr. Ransom. We thank him very much. So we also had Dr. James Ratcliffe and Dr. Jacob Hochhalter, hope I pronounced that name right who sat down with us and really were helpful in trying to give us some focus and get our project on, on, on the track that, uh, that it ended up being on. So we want to especially thank those. And just sort of going along with what Karen said, at, uh, at their branch, what they do is take everything down from the nanoscale, from molecular level all the way up to the entire uh, entire structure, whether that's an airplane, whether that's a Mars lander, and that was really interesting to see. They, they as uh, Dr. Ransom commented, they sit between a building over here that is making the materials, trying to come up with the new plastics and the composites and the steels, and the folks over here which are trying to uh, put those together and make a launcher, make uh, an aircraft, and that combination is really quite interesting that they, that they sit in there. Yes, and one of the things that was very, very evident from all that we saw and we learned when we listened to different presentations was that that process of modeling and simulation is used throughout the engineering process when they're looking at uh, what's causing cracks, whether it be at the nano level, um, where they're examining um, things so that they can design different composites, different materials that hopefully will prevent damage from happening in the future. Um, it's just a continuous process of having those mathematical models to go by, the modeling and simulation process working together to come up with a better design that will solve a problem in, in uh, the world today. So, we're with the materials guys. The question is, why material? Why do structures matter? And I'm going to have to apologize here. It looks like our screen resolution is throwing some of our slides out of sorts. But um, so one of the questions there is, OK, why does it matter? So here's a short little clip that's uh, just a little fun to watch that we got off uh, offline. It's from a video or uh, a game called Cargo Bridge at physicsgames.net, and does a pretty good job of explaining why design matters. Definitely a situation that you wouldn't want to have happen to you. Um, another type of situation where you wouldn't want to have uh, extensive damage or um, people injured as a result of an accident was during the Apollo missions where when we were walking throughout the buildings, one of the mottos of the Apollo missions is um, failure is not an option, uh, which talks about human life and the value of that, and not just the costs associated, it's human life that you want to prevent any uh, damage from happening too. And a tie-in with that is uh, an Aloha flight from 1988. This uh, aircraft has to, well, was quite different in its characteristic flight pattern. It was hopping between islands, having to land, take off, land, take off much more frequently than 
a typical aircraft does in, uh, in that design. And likewise, it was in an environment that was highly corrosive in the, uh, uh, in the salt water. So again, why do materials matter? This is why they matter. These are the types of uh, events that you're trying to prevent and or take into uh, consideration. On the first day here at Langley on Monday, July 18th, Dr. Stephen Scotty had a presentation for all of us that were having the pleasure of being here for two weeks. And this slide that was just shown briefly, and perhaps we could show it again, shows the three-legged stool problem-solving paradigm that he had as part of his presenta presentation. Uh, it was advocated by an associate of his, and uh, that was something that stuck with us when Steve and I were spinning our wheels about, well, how are we going to put this together? What is it we really want to do? This really solidified for us the ideas that we wanted to put together, how the mathematical model is tied to both the experiment and the design, the science, and the engineering, how do you, you, what is the point of doing that because you want to create an optimum or optimal situation uh, to have all the constraints satisfied. And this is what we do all the time uh, as, as engineers, but maybe not what we do all the time in our classroom. So from a classroom's perspective, we're frequently just focused on the math or some other uh, teaching quality as opposed to maybe doing the experiment or maybe all we do is experiments but not the analysis, not the mathematics, or maybe we don't do the optimization. So uh, we try to put all that together for our project, our lesson plan. And our project was entitled uh, as you may see shortly, Building Bridges, Exploring Deflection and Optimization Using Modeling and Simulation. Um, one of the first things that we looked at and, and discussed with people over in the uh, DDT and R branch um, was how important the structure of different materials is. And sort of tying in with that, I'm an industrial technology teacher. I teach all kinds of shop classes, but I also teach an engineering class. Karen, on the other hand, is a math teacher. She teaches ninth and 10th graders. So we were trying to come up with something that would incorporate a little bit of both of those, uh, not just uh, a shop-oriented building engineering side, but also a math side and some way to uh, marry those two together. And I think we've done a, a fair job at that. We have. We, it was a little bit challenging in the beginning because we had to find something that could really hit a broad range of students. He has some, I have an honors geometry class where I would use this back home where kids have had Algebra 1, they're quite skilled. It would be an ongoing long-term project for them. And Steve has some students that are very talented in his engineering class, but um, other students who may find more challenges mathematically and in the world of science in his industrial technology classes. So we were looking for a way to, to be able to develop something that we could use for all of those students. So our general overall thought is let's make a bridge and let's talk about a bridge. Most of the material that's out there currently is full structure bridges as far as simulation or uh, competitions, they are, they're looking at the, the finished product of a bridge. And we want to look a little bit closer at just a beam and focus on the characteristics of that beam. And so in our lesson to our students, one of the first things we would uh, introduce is if you've got a beam, what about it makes it bend? Uh, why does it bend? How does it bend? What characteristics? go into that bending and open that up for conversation. Uh, things that the students, that we expect the students to bring up is uh, the material, uh, maybe its shape, how far apart they are. If, uh, if we put our loads, uh, or rather our supports way off on the end and, and load this in the middle, it, it deflects quite a bit more than if we bring our, our span in, make a shorter span, it's harder to bend. Um, 
maybe the cross section. All of these are thoughts that we're trying to get the kids to bring out, or bring out of the kids rather, um, including the, in, the environment. So all kinds of things that go into that, uh, many of which we can calculate, maybe calculate's the wrong word, that we can summarize in a mathematical formula uh, or represent with uh, a constant. So again, what are these beam bending characteristics of load, length, support, material, shape, and environment all have to be considered when um, students are deciding what they might use for the culminating project um, associated with this unit. Um, for instance, we, there needs to be a discussion because these students have no, we're starting at the beginning because these students have no experience building anything particularly my students in honors geometry, several of them have never built any of anything. So we would have to have a discussion, as will be shown on a slide in a sec, about beam material, would, would you use rubber? Well, rubber would not be such a good uh, thing to use for a beam because rubber has a tendency to be very flexible, not rigid so it would not support loads well versus a, a, sub, a material such as titanium, which is pretty heavy, and they, that may not work for the purposes that you're intending for as well. Uh, sometimes it's deceiving, and we'll talk a little more about that later with basswood, such as this piece that I'm holding here, which is very similar to uh, balsa wood. Um, it seems as though because they are such thin and tiny um, pieces, very, very narrow, um, that they would not support much. Um, and in fact, as part of this unit, students can discover ways that you can um, piece uh, or structure a basswood object and make it very, very strong um, unexpectedly. And so, uh that brings us to our two general topics that we're going to talk about with beams. And the first is the material. So what is it about this material that makes it flexible and easy to bend? And what is it about this material that makes it so hard and rigid? And Karen, if you could grab me one of those basswoods. Uh, so here's basswood, and here's something that's not basswood. This is a carbon composite, both about the same uh, thickness there. But obviously, this one has a lot of flexibility, and this one, I can probably put my full weight on it and not bend it. Why? It's a function of the material. Not its geometry, per se, okay? Yeah, this one has other geometry associated with it, but the part that I'm bending is just here on the corner. So that, that introduces the theme of uh, modulus of elasticity. Modulus of elasticity, or Young's modulus, is one of those constants that's out there in a table someplace that is trying to describe how this material responds to stress. Another way of saying that would be how this material, once deflected or deformed, which is a bend, how it would, if I, let, if I release the pressure on my thumbs, how does that beam want to return to the state it was in prior to being stressed? or having a force applied to it. So if that's one of our first thoughts, our, se our criteria, our second criteria is uh, cross-section. Piece of basswood, as Karen was pointing out, bends really easily. Another piece of basswood, but a different cross-sectional geometry to this one, much, much stronger and, and doesn't, uh, doesn't bend, really resists bending quite a bit. So what is it that makes those two different? This modified into an I-beam doesn't bend. How, does, how do we account for that? And it turns out that's the geometry. And it, uh, we, we capture that in what's called the moment of inertia, represented by I here on the screen. And as its equation suggests, it's a function of geometry. Uh, the measure of the base, measure of the height, uh, and their importance. Right, and, and um, the intuitive notion of this idea of moment of inertia is um, 
the idea that a material has a tendency to resist bending. Um, for students, we would, we would talk in, in those terms as well as the geometry. Well, well what does it really mean in a physical sense? Um, and try to relate that to something that they can wrap their, their heads around. So with those two concepts covered, we would take the class and provide them all with a piece of basswood. And we would try and back calculate the modulus of elasticity. One of the lessons that we learned here uh, in our two weeks is that although the modulus of elasticity is in a text someplace, you can find it, you can put that number in, it may not be representative of the material that you have in hand. So one of our first projects for the students is to take an algebraic equation and manipulate it back so they can solve for a specific variable, uh, in this case, E. So by solving for E, and then performing a really short lab where we put this beam at a set length, put a set weight on that beam, and watch it deflect, and measure that deflection, the students now have all the criteria or all the variables except for the modulus of elasticity. They know the geometry, uh, they know the weight, they know the span. So a really good algebraic math problem. So again in the slide you can see they'll know why max, I don't know if we mentioned it before, but why sub max is that, that distance that is referred to as the deflection, the, the distance between the center of the original beam and the center of the beam when it's deformed. And uh, that's a known quantity. The weight is a known quantity. The length of the span is a known quantity. Um, and the moment of inertia they have. So everything they need is there except for um, the elasticity E. For my Algebra II students, uh, this would be a great exercise where I, I don't think I'm the only math teacher who's heard, when am I ever going to use this? Why do we have to just manipulate these equations? This is something they could hang their hat on. This is a reason. You need to be able to uh, manipulate equations and solve for any of the variables that are in the equations in order to do operations like this. Exactly. So um, we've got now two parts of our three-legged stool. We've got a little bit of an experimentation going on. We've got a little bit of mathematics going on. And now we're going to ask the kids to do some optimization. That is, we're now going to put some constraints on them. And these will just be hypothetical constraints that I give you a beam, and I would like you to design that beam such that it has a set deflection for a set weight over uh, a set span. So. Um, there are a couple of web-based uh, ways that you can do that. One of them, as we'll see on the screen soon, is to use the free online resource GeoGebra. Okay. GeoGebra no, okay. is um, a nice um, software that allows you to put the algebra with the geometry and a spreadsheet. You can see across the screen, running from left to right, the different values that are running on the far left. Um, the uh, cursor is now going to the region that shows um, the shape of a cross-sectional um, area. This is rectangular shape. The cursor is now on uh, B, the base um, length, and H, the height length in red. And as he moves the sliders, uh, they, they, you are able to change the values of the base and the height. You can set the load if you'd like to set it at 20 and the activity, uh, the culminating activity that we do, we want um, a length of 20 inches. And um, so they're all right there and you can see down below if the cursor were to move down a little bit further, <laughs> uh, you can see there's the equation for the moment of inertia uh, with a calculated value, um, y being the deflection distance, and um, that value is there. And then beneath it, the area of that cross-section uh, cross uh, that's shown to the right. So staying on this screen, 
what we would do as far as the optimization, so Karen's done an explanation of this being a cross section of the beam, how is that affecting these numbers over here? What we would challenge the students to do is manipulate this point A such that you have a deflection of, for example, a half an inch. So students get their point, move it around, finagle it such that that number becomes a half or uh, as close to a half as they can, and they say, hey, Mr. Nystrom, I've got the point. It's, uh, it's at B at 0.08 and H of 0.44. Across the room, you would hope to get, uh, get answers for, for that question, and they're all going to be different. So we asked the, the, we throw it out to the kids, well, why are they different? Can you find other uh, a point A that also create a deflection of a half inch? And one of the cool things that you can do on GeoGebra is turn a trace on. And if I now grab A and maneuver it around, trying to keep that Y at a half, I leave a little trail of points behind me. And let's see if I can actually keep it at a half. Skilled engineer that I am. All right, so come back and discuss with the kids, well, what is this collection of points trying to show me? Doesn't seem to be linear, and in fact, it's not. If we continue this out, it would meet this curve right here. And so, you can enable that or not enable that in the beginning, so you can have a discussion with students as to what their expectations are associated um, with that value. That's right, so we don't give them the, the, the secrets just yet. And then finally, the optimization. Okay, so there's lots of, lots of values that make that half inch deflection. Which one is the, the best answer? And it turns out that the area gets smaller and smaller and smaller as this beam gets taller and taller and taller and taller and skinnier. So is there an optimum uh, answer to that? Well, that's hard to say. Because there are limits. In, in right. real life, you can't necessarily get a, a rectangular cross-section of 0 0.02 inches or a height of 0 0.66 inches. There, there are realistic aspects that come in that students need to understand. Uh, the characteristic that as that beam is getting taller and thinner, my area is getting smaller and smaller is important, um, very important, uh, but they also have to understand what are the numbers that they're looking at? Are they reasonable numbers in a practical sense? Um, could you get materials in those dimensions? And so here's an example, again, going back to our basswood. That might be the dimensions of an optimal beam, but it's so tall and skinny that it brings up other faults, and that is maybe it's going to buckle. So um, I'm not sure what, there you go, that kind of shows it. Uh, so it is strong in that dimension, but maybe it has some faults that you'd like to get around as well. Good on the one hand, maybe bad on the other. That's right. There are other online, free online resources that uh, students can look at the relationships among these different variables. Another of them is on an engineering calculator website. And up on the screen now, uh, you see the title Bending Beam Calculator. And you have several choices of um, support structures. In the, the culminating activity that we do in this unit, we're using uh, simply supported beams and bridges. And um, students will be looking at different cross sections eventually as part of it. You'll notice that, again, simulations have run. The equations are there. Um, you can uh, set Young's modulus of elasticity over on the far right under constants, the moment of inertia I. Um, and the value of, I guess in this one, it looks like volume. The screen isn't quite low enough for me to see. Okay, there we go. Um, the equations are all right there. Another important aspect for students, as we've mentioned before, is this cross-sectional shape and associated areas. Um, and moments of inertia. And moments of inertia. So here again, Lots of different shapes. We just introduced the kids to a rectangle, not too complicated. 
much more complicated when you get to I-beams, T-beams, L-beams, you name it. Here are a bunch of options for the students to try and uh, utilize and find those values of I, which in our culminating project will try and, uh, which will, excuse me, which they'll need in their culminating project. In reality, again, what we were looking for in the culminating project was for them to use a certain amount of resources, materials, um, in order to design a bridge uh, satisfying certain criteria that um, would enable them to support uh, a certain load. Um, again, the reality of the situation is most of the time you want to save money, so the optimal solution would be one where you use the least amount of materials and therefore you have um, the least cross-sectional area total being used. So, They've now done a bunch of research on, on little things, and our culminating project is let's make a bridge with the constraints that you just saw on the screen. They're going to get two of these wafer-thin boards, one of which is going to be the roadbed, so they can't use that, and the other is going to be a support structure that they get to manipulate any way they like, so they can cut their second board into strips, uh, and, and affix them to the bottom and get themselves a cross-sectional area that's going to meet that deflection need because, as we found out, it's really easy to build something that doesn't bend uh, or doesn't bend very easily, I should say. I learned I-beams are very, very strong. We went through the process, the kids will, and uh, had to revamp several times, but that's okay. Right. We did not give up. I mean, this was our, our original, and then the lessons learned was, let's try and do different I-beams. Well, it turns out most schools don't have the equipment to bend this, uh, and we didn't have that equipment here either, so. Uh, Very strong. But this turns out to be really easy to manipulate. Kids can uh, cut this up with simply a utility knife and put it together with standard wood glue, something you can do in any classroom. You don't need a shop. Uh, right, we can do it in my geometry classroom. Uh, the materials are such they're, that they're inexpensive. Again, you need two um, strips of the basswood that are three inches wide by a sixteenth of an inch deep and uh, two feet long. Um, and in the testing phase, you need about 20 pounds of water that you'll put in a bucket and um, load the bridge with. Uh, and again, the materials are accessible to most students in most school systems. And, and that's part of our design was intentional. We were hoping to create something that most any school district would be able to get the supplies or if they didn't have them um, could, without spending a lot of money, get what they needed. So let me show you really quickly what we, what we came up with. And this is my, uh, my hotel special. So one road bed unobstructed, didn't do anything with it, and one cross section. So it looks like a bunch of little, uh, little, little holes that run through there. Didn't take much to, to put together, did take some patience, did take some precision, and trying not to get glue everywhere. I do have some imaginations as to what kids could do with this, and it might be kind of bad, so I guess I would uh, caution that right up front. Uh, and this is also a really simple overview of what you would do, you know, just two supports on either end and uh, a bucket is what we have right now that probably wouldn't work terribly well, but you know, just something that you can load in the center, has a, a set weight, and then measure the deflection from point to point. Uh, fairly simple project and yet, again, uh, one of the things that Karen and I really like about this project is that there's no one right answer. There's lots of options. And to see the, and allow the kids to expound on that, uh, I really look forward to that. Yes, and, and again, the, the biggest thing that we were looking for is that the bridge satisfied all the criteria that one full three inch wide sheet of basswood was used. The second one was used to create a support structure of any beam shape uh, they could create. 
Again, we encourage them to learn about composite cross sections as we showed through various methods um, using the online resources available. And um, be, again, one of the criteria was to support the 20 pound weight. And in the <coughs> test phase, um, while we may have, we don't know what's going to happen because we haven't run this, but we may have several groups that create designs that do support the 20 pounds of water with just two small sheets of basswood. Uh, again, how will we determine which is an optimal solution uh, by the amount of waste they have left over, which is tied to the amount of materials that they use? Uh, I don't know that we mentioned it before, but a notebook is an integral part of this process. Students are asked in the unit to keep notes in the uh, work that they're doing. They need to be complete. Calculations need to be shown. Both of us were struck by um, the visits that we made to the um, labs in that a number of scientists and engineers here do use the lab notebooks to document things in a physical form. Uh, I think everyone is uh, throughout the U.S. is in a move to get things online, but there are still hard copy documents, and, and that's an important phase or portion of this project. And I would second that. I was, one, surprised that they're still doing things on paper, and two, really encouraged because this is a project, and we would, in our assessment, it's document, document, document. What did you do? How did you do it? Why did you do it? If you didn't like it, what happened? Uh, how did you reassess that? So as far as assessment, um, the completion of the notebooks, adherence to safety rules, uh, accuracy of worksheets. We've got several worksheets that need to, that, uh, need to get completed. Uh, did they make an optimum bridge design? Although, honestly, you know, that might be the difference between an A plus and, you know, a perfect grade. Uh, really, it's the experience, a lab report uh, as well. Yes, and, and by quality, as we have listed on there, um, is it aesthetically pleasing? If you were a person in the market that had to buy that, and, and I don't mean it has to be decorated, but it shouldn't have glue all over the place. It shouldn't have... Um, extra things stuck in the glue, uh, that sort of thing. Uh, it, it does have to satisfy the characteristics of only using the two pieces of basswood to create the structure. All right. Um, one of the things that both students and teachers would need to do, because we haven't run this before um, and they haven't experienced, I don't think any students at our school have experienced much like this ever before. We have a few students on a robotics team who may have done something in a similar manner, but our general population hasn't done a lot of activities like this. So it, it needs assessment both on the student end in terms of their reflections of what's going on and on the teacher end. Um, so there would be reflections as to the clarity of the instructions, uh, the ease of use of the tools and the simulations and the tools that were used in the um, lab itself because the projects are completed in the classroom where utility knives are used and um, it's, it's safer to have that happening in the classroom. All right, so one of the major aspects that we would, you know, as a teacher, uh, we would want to determine whether what we started out with, the three-legged stool approach to um, the problem-solving paradigm, did our students learn the process of engineering design through modeling and simulation? Um, and we're hoping through the documentation in their notebooks and the final products, their bridges, uh, we'll have a pretty good idea, uh, especially um, by reading the lab notebooks about their level and understand, of understanding, and we will solicit their feedback in terms of their thoughts on did it, did it help them to learn the process um, or not. So uh, what are the next steps? Um, 
Well, we'll be, like we'll be using this in our classrooms, and, oh, as yes. we have mentioned before. Uh, I, I will be piloting it as a long-term project, probably beginning in the second quarter of the year in my honors geometry class. Uh, it does require about two weeks uh, of, we are on an 80-minute block. And um, so I would have to distribute that two-week period over a longer period of time so that I could get through the other content that I need to cover this year as well. And I'm not sure, Steve, when we should be implementing Well, as an industrial technology teacher, I can pretty much fit this into an intro class anywhere, an engineering class maybe up front. Uh, and we were talking about it with uh, uh, Dr. Ransom that, you know, there's calculus involved here too. If we tweak this a little further, we could sell it to uh, a higher end math class to do, do calculus based or differential integration uh, to, to, to find additional information out about how that beam's bending. Uh, and what are we planning to do when we get back to our districts to spread the good word? Uh, the first thing in, a, in, in my department, the math department, um, both John Fitzgerald and I will be presenting at one of our early math department meetings to share with other members in the department what it was like. Um, from there, I am planning to visit the four sending middle schools that we have coming to our high school to describe the project to teachers first, and then I would open it up to students who are welcome to come visit, or, or I could come back and present on a different day. Um, and I am going to a state conference and a New England conference as well. And, and ditto for me. I, I've got a New England and a state conference of uh, technology teachers that I'll be presenting this to as well as, of course, following along with uh, within our district and doing middle school and uh, sending schools. So. so NASA, thank you very much. Dr. Jonathan Ransom and Associates and everyone involved, thank you for an awesome two weeks. It's been a wonderful opportunity and we appreciate it very much. I would double, triple that. I mean, it's, it's been fabulous. Couldn't have asked for more. Thank you much.